Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, it's Marlon Reese. Uh, I'm first gentleman of Colorado. Uh, more than anything, though, I'm an animal lover. And uh, today, I'm particularly excited. We are here to learn about bats, the bats that are in residence here at the zoo. Uh, and we have, uh, I'm joined by Troy, uh, who is a bat expert, at least uh, relative to me. I have lots of questions about uh, the bats you guys have here at the zoo and, and also the conservation work that you guys are doing. I always want to keep a spotlight on, on all the good that you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, not just here in Colorado, but around the world. Sure. Uh, so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here, Troy. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Troy. Uh, I've been at Denver Zoo for coming up on seven years, uh, and I've been caring for the bats for pretty much all of those seven years. Uh, and uh, I am a, a reptile guy through and through, but um, I really have always had an interest, interest in bats. And uh, ever since working with them, I've really developed uh, a love and passion for them. Um, I tell people they haven't lived until they've had a baby bat wrapped around their finger. I really have grown uh, to love uh, the bats that we, that we have here at Denver Zoo. Uh, we currently have three different species, uh, Seba short-tailed fruit bats, uh, Jamaican fruit bats, uh, and common vampire bats. Uh, and we're standing in front of our fruit bat cave. Uh, this houses majority Seba short-tailed fruit bats, uh, and then there are uh, a few Jamaican fruit bats in there as well. Um, I heard, or rather I guess I saw, uh, a neat diagram that showed the skeletal structure of bats mm -hmm. and compared it to people mm -hmm. uh, because I guess people forget that they're mammals yeah, yeah. and uh, it looked like they had little fingers so I wanted to ask about whether or not they have dexterity and are able to grab a hold like we are. They, they definitely do. Um, yeah, if you were to look at a bat's wing, uh, it presents just like my hand, where their thumb is most likely this little hook uh, that comes off, and then each finger is just elongated, and then they have a skin, uh, also called patagium, that is connecting between each digit, which allows them to fly. Uh, and then how they do fly is uh, my professor in college was also a bat fan, and she says that bats just constantly do jazz hands. Um, and that's, yes. that's how they fly. Um, and it's, it's pretty hilarious, but they definitely have that dexterity. Um, they do have the ability to grab onto things, um, and I especially see it when they land on me or hanging onto me, um, or grabbing onto those fruit, uh, larger fruit items that I feed them uh, when they're feeding. Uh, and then in the case of the vampire bats, um, they'll actually walk uh, on their, I don't know if it's their wrists or their elbows, um, but uh, they have the ability to walk around and crawl around. And that's another reason why I call them the gremlins, because when yes. I go to feed them, they'll land on the ground and call it crawl around all fast. And, and uh, it. it's pretty awesome. Would, would you share a little bit about what echolocation is? Yeah. It's a pretty cool uh, adaptation. It, it really is. And so, uh, yeah, what echolocation is, they're submitting uh, a sound frequency, a very high-pitched sound frequency uh, that is radiating out from the bat. Uh, and then bouncing off objects, and in this case, usually insects, uh, and then that sound frequency is bouncing back to the bats, uh, and the bats are able to hear it um, or sense it in some way. Uh, and that is giving them kind of direction where that, where that insect is or where that object is, right? Um, and so bats are, or at least your Microcoraptera that utilize echolocation, are constantly emitting it. Um, and it was really interesting, several years ago, uh, we put a camera inside the cave and, um, and that camera actually picked up the echolocation and once I played back the video, you could hear all these clicks and squeaks, which... Uh, non-stop. Non-stop. And I mean, especially with the amount of bats that we have in the cave, um, but it was, it was non-stop and, and when I'm in there cleaning, I don't hear it at all because it's such a high frequency that human ears can't pick up on it. It's amazing. Um, but it, it is, it really is and, and they use it so frequently uh, that I mean, I'll have a bat flying straight at my face and then once the echolocation gets back to them, they turn at the last second. It works um, fast. It works very fast. Yeah, because their vision is not great. Is it, uh, and, and it's precise enough that it can pick up a, a tiny insect? Yeah, very, very small insects. Because a lot of your small insect, insectivorous bats, um, like here in Colorado, we have the, the small brown bat, 
Um, they're mainly predating upon gnats, mosquitoes, small flies, uh, and that echolocation has to be exact enough for this very small bat to pick up this even smaller insect. And, and the insects are moving too, so yeah. they have to be able to keep up. And that's with why they're, you know, <laughs> em emitting it very frequently. Oh my um, but yeah, it's incredible. They really are incredible animals. What an am and so the you mentioned the little brown bat, mm -hmm. and uh, one of my questions was actually if any of the three species that you have here at the zoo are native to Colorado. They are not. Um, all of the bats we have here at Denver Zoo are Central and South American species. Um, the uh, the Ceiba fruit-tailed bat is actually one of the most common um, bats that you'll see within AZA zoos, uh, but also one of the most common species of bats that you'll see out in the world. Um, they are one of the most populous species of bats uh, out in their world, which um, I don't know exact populations, but there's some caves that will have tens of thousands of bats just within one cave, it's, which it is pretty amazing. It must be an intimidating sight. Well, I guess if you happen upon it by accident. Yeah, sure. If you're sure. studying, yeah. what do you expect to see? Um, I, I was actually out walking my dog, uh, Gia, the other day with, uh, with the governor and with our kids, and uh, we live in Boulder, and uh, when we were kids, we remembered seeing lots of bats in the night sky, usually around dusk. Mm -hmm. And uh, then for a few years, it seemed they disappeared. And now it looks like they, they've sort of um, regained some of their numbers. But we were wondering where they go during the daytime, because they're in a city, it yeah, seems sure. like. And, and we're not aware of any giant caves nearby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, so one fun fact that not many people know is that bats actually do migrate. Um, we, uh, to my knowledge, have um, at most three different species of bats within the state. Um, only one of them, the small, the small brown bat, stays here year round, uh, and then the other two species migrate through. Um, but uh, the small brown bat, uh, they can travel very far distances within a given night um, to you know, find those insects or find those food items uh, and then retreat back to their caves. Um, but they also will potentially nest or roost uh, in um, you know, human-built structures um, on occasion. You know, bats are, bats are, are ruthless, they're very opportunistic. Um, they are the second most populous mammal on this planet uh, and they wouldn't be able to do so if they weren't so uh, or had that ability to adapt. Ah, yes. um, to their environment. So no matter where they are, they find a way. They do, yes. To exist. Yeah, bats find a way. Right? <laughs> I love it. It's kind of uh, has overtones of Jurassic Park. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I um, a couple years ago, when uh, at the start of, of uh, the COVID pandemic, I uh, and I'm always thinking in these terms. I want to figure out ways to. Um, highlight the significance of each species and uh, at CPW and uh, the Department of Natural Resources we're all always talking about each species playing a role in its ecosystem and why they're important and why they're not to be feared. Mm -hmm. I know bats uh, sort of unfairly have a lot of negative associations. They that, definitely do. Um, but I, I was hoping that we could talk a little bit about some of the important things that they do within their ecosystem. For sure. I mean, the, the first thing's the obvious is insect control. Um, you know, one, I believe it's one small brown bat can eat up to like a thousand insects in one night. Um, and so that is amazing insect control, Absolutely. population control, especially for those people that are not overly fond of mosquitoes, yes. um, right? The, 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 yeah, Even less, less well-liked. Uh, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but then for those small fruit bats uh, and omnivorous bats, what a lot of people don't realize is these are huge pollinators. Um, your small fruit bats you know, are predating upon or going around and, and drinking nectar or, or eating these fruit uh, and pollinating all of these uh, plants that flower at night or, or you know, fruit-bearing trees. Uh, and they are almost as important pollinators as bees are. What are, um, what are some plants, out of, just out of curiosity, that sure. bats like? Uh, most of your flowering, uh, fruit-bearing trees uh, are going to be great for that. So, you know, we talked about it, peaches, pears, apples, um, a, lot of, a lot of plants like that bats will love. Um, you know, they also will attract insects, which will also attract bats. Um, and then another thing is building bat boxes. 
uh, bat boxes are just these little roosting uh, boxes that you can create to give bats a break or even create a home for them while they're migrating or flying around. Um, and uh, you know, those alone will really help bat populations. Um, and then so supporting you know, your local uh, government associations like Colorado Parks and Wildlife, uh, especially in these potentially scary times where we're experimenting or, or experiencing white nose or the potential of white nose fungus. Yes, I, know, I, was, um, I was so sorry to hear that it had been discovered here. A lot yeah. of the time it seems like um, Colorado is sort of safe uh, in the middle, and yeah. it does, a lot of these uh, diseases don't reach us, mm -hmm. but then we have the uh, warming weather and, and climate change, and it seems like things are pushing in from the, the yeah, coast. Yeah, for sure. More reason, I guess, to appreciate bats that they um, also get those insects that are vectors for uh, yeah, various definitely. diseases. Mm -hmm. Without pollinators, it would be a dramatically different planet. Oh, yeah. gosh. I. Um, so, what uh, are there any threats that uh, that are that people or or conditions uh, are posing to bats that we should be aware of? And most definitely, yeah. I mean, obviously, the most common ones are going to be habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, climate change, um, pesticides, and herbicides are a huge one for bats because uh, talking about you know the trophic level, if we eliminate their food you know, we eliminate bats. If we get rid of these mass populations of mosquitoes, which a lot of people are trying to do, we're gonna get rid of a main food source for our little little brown bat we have here in Colorado. Um, but then the other, the other thing that is becoming a really big problem uh, is a syndrome called white nose fungus uh, that has been more commonly uh, presented uh, over in eastern, eastern US, uh, which is a, a syndrome that is uh, decimating bat populations. Um, and unfortunately, white nose fungus was just discovered here in Colorado. I, it's not been found on a bat yet, um, at least to my knowledge, but it's been found, um, which is kind of a very scary thought. A shame. That's, so people can carry white, whatever causes white nose syndrome, you said it's a fungus? Yeah, I mean, it, we, to my knowledge, can't be infected with it, um, but if we go walking through a cave or where an area that, that, you know, this white nose fungus is found, we can potentially carry it on our boots, carry it on our clothes, uh, and, and transmit it that way. Um, you know, one thing in, in the other side of my world, you know, like I mentioned being a reptile guy or amphibian guy, um, chytrid fungus is another real big problem. Um, and same deal, um, if you're walking through or hiking through an area that is chytrid fungus pro positive, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, chytrid fungus uh, is a fungus that is decimating amphibian populations worldwide. Uh, but yeah, if we go hiking through a pond or a stream or an area that has chytrid and then come back home and go hiking to another area, uh, we have carried that fungus to potentially a non-chytrid fungus positive site. So same goes for, for white nose fungus potentially. Are there things that, that people can do to limit the uh, likelihood that they would would accidentally bring a fungus like that into a habitat where it could do damage? Most definitely. Um, there are several caves within Colorado that are protected, especially during uh, certain parts of the year, times of the year, um, because it is known where bats roost there. Uh, so just making sure that you don't enter those uh, areas without permission or, or entering them during the appropriate times of year. And then if you do go into areas where uh, there are significant bat populations, making sure that you're disinfecting your clothes, your boots, all of that after you leave the area or even before you enter the area, uh, it's just good practice. You know, if we want to see these animals thrive and survive and keep them around, keep our, keep our chocolate and, and peaches and melons, you know, we need to, we need to do our part, right? Care about um, absolutely care about uh, the world around us mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully you know some of the great work that you guys do in conservation uh, and drawing attention to the importance of these species is radiating out and people are becoming aware I know that's sort of one of the joys of, of me being able to visit you guys and find out about why these animals are important and why people should care about them mm -hmm. um, I have to ask, uh, what what should viewers know about vampire bats, and what might they might they think they know that yeah. might not be true? Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, I'll tell you, I love the vampire bats. Um, people should definitely not be afraid of them because they are they're they're awesome. Uh, I like to call them little gremlins because they totally <laughs> act like little gremlins. But but first, you know, debunking that myth of vampire bats suck blood. Uh, they don't. 
Uh, vampire bats do have incredibly sharp teeth, uh, and so what they do is they'll land on the ground, uh, usually crawl over to the legs of a, of a prey item, and in most cases it's cows, um, and they'll make a little incision with their teeth, uh, and then they also have an anticoagulative property to their saliva, so the blood doesn't clot and just continues to flow. And the bat just sits there and drinks it up. They just, they just lap it up with their tongue, similar to how a dog drinks water. Uh, and then once they're full, they just carry on their way. And once those anticoagulants flush out, the wound heals and the, the cow's perfectly fine. Um, the cow even barely feels it, because it usually happens at night while the cow is sleeping. Um, but, uh, but yeah, vampire bats, you know, they don't want to drink all the blood because then they're eliminating a food source. So they just make a very small incision, drink what they need, and then carry on their way. It's a um, funny, funny thought to imagine any species just wiping out its... Its, it's food source, food right? Source. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think the only ones that do that are humans, right? That's, we do but, seem uh, to take... Yeah, yeah. We like to take... If we like it, we take more of it. Exactly. <laughs> but... Um, uh, but yeah, and then that's the other thing is, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt oh, you. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say they are very dietary specialists. So um, for all those thinking that, oh, man, a vampire bat will drink my blood, most likely not. Um, these, these bats prefer cow blood. Um, other AZA uh, zoos and aquariums have actually tried other types of blood with their vampire bats, and they show a preference toward cow blood. So they can tell the difference. You know, I'm in there multiple times a day, and uh, they're honestly more afraid of me than I am, am of them, and they're not looking at me as a food source at all. Uh, are so. there things that people can do here in Colorado to support the work that you guys are doing uh, to help bats, study them, understand them more, and, and debunk some of these myths that bats unfair, unfairly are pinned with? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the most important thing is going to be education, right? Is educating yourself about bats and understanding that they're not out here to get us. You know, unfortunately, TV and media has done, done very negative things for bats, and they've developed this reputation that they really don't deserve. Um, I mean, if you look really close at a bat, they really are these cute and cuddly, furry little creatures uh, that, you know, are just, are just here to live, help our environment, help pollinate. Um, and so, yeah, just educate yourself about bats, you know. Um, I always like to say that, uh, you know, usually when people are afraid of something, they just don't know anything about it. And education can overcome fear most, most of the time. And so doing that education and then coming to, coming to the zoo and supporting your local zoos uh, in their efforts for conservation, um, and even with bats. Um, and, uh, yeah, just learning more about them, um, developing pollinator gardens, uh, especially those nighttime flowering plants that can really help your bat populations. Uh, it's um, a great reminder, I think, what you said, is once you actually become educated, then you can appreciate, mm -hmm. and it dispels fear, mm -hmm. uh, exactly. which too many animals uh, do get pinned with or, or blamed for things, and we're always looking for scapegoats. Mm -hmm. um, so it's... This especially is a great opportunity, I think, for people to learn about yeah. an unsung hero mm -hmm. in the natural world. For sure. So, for thank sure. you, Troy. Yeah, no problem. Really Thanks for coming by. Me.